good day, ladies and gentlemen. For me, finding a game is relatively difficult. The days of KOTOR and Mass Effect are long gone. And while there are a few good first-person shooters being released, like Shadow Warrior 2013 and Doom 2016, by and large, the first-person shooter market is filled with gray mush. Finding a game that actually keeps and holds my attention is very, very rare. In fact, the last game to really hold my attention was Prey 2017, and that was over a year ago now. Recently, quite by accident, I found a game that was able to keep and hold my attention. And that game was, of course, the no-budget title that is SAS Secure Tomorrow. I found this game after being introduced to Examined Life of Gaming. He reviewed the game and found it to be a mediocre title. But to me, the game appeared to be just the kind of game I was looking for. I am, of course, a big fan of first-person shooters, and over the many years of gaming, I have played a great many of them. These days, I primarily just play Doom Wads, as modern first-person shooters simply are not fun to me. They use simplistic level design, they abuse cutscenes to the point where you maybe get five minutes of gameplay in before you hit another goddamn cutscene. And let's not forget the constant overuse of bloody arenas. For some time, when I found myself wanting to play a first-person shooter, I envisioned a game where you had modern weapons fighting enemies that could actually shoot back. Seems like that should have been an easy game to find, right? Well, just try finding such a game and you will see that it's easier said than done. So when I saw a video on SAS Secure Tomorrow, I was excited to say the least, as it appeared to be the exact kind of game I was looking for. Finally, a bloody game where you have an M4 carbine and you can shoot the enemy instead of sitting around watching cutscenes where your player character shoots the enemy without any input from you. And yes, I am indeed well aware of the Rainbow Six and Delta Force games, but I said I wanted a rifle and an enemy to shoot. I did not say that I wanted to spend six goddamn hours planning an operation where I get to shoot one guy once and then let the rest of my AI team do the rest. So, to sum up, I wanted to play a bloody simple first person shooter where you have a rifle, a modern rifle, and some bad guys. And that is just what you get in the no-budget SAS Secure Tomorrow. This is an example of one of those games that you used to see all the time in half-price bookstores. Games from the mysterious land of Eastern Europe. Games that were five to ten bucks. Games that, while not as polished as AAA games, were at least usually functional. So while it's not double A, it's at least an single A, I guess? SAS Secure Tomorrow was developed by Polish developer City Interactive and released way back in the heady days of 2008. And it utilizes the classic Lithtech Jupiter EX engine, an engine that should be familiar to all the fear veterans out there. Long ago in the mists of history, SAS Secure Tomorrow was called the poor man's fear. This was seen as a bad thing back then, because fear was just one good first-person shooter among many. In the year 2018, that's actually something good, because while it's a poor man's fear, well, it's a poor man's fear, and is therefore better than the gray mush we have today. It's really quite amazing how much we took for granted back then. SAS Secure Tomorrow is a first-person shooter of the second order. You cannot carry ten weapons on your person at any one time, but you can at least carry four of them. And while you have regenerative health, it's not bloody Wolverine grade, and thus you can be killed in just a few hits. The game has great weapon variety, and you actually have reasons to use different weapons at different times. However, like in real life, most of the time you will be using the M4 Carbine, as it has plentiful ammo, most of the time at least, and has British SAS magic. You see, there is a little known aspect of Arthurian lore. Apparently, Myrdin cast a spell that stated that all future British armsmen would have their shots fly straight and true. So therefore, you can remove the red dot sight from the M4 and attach a scope. And both sights will retain their zero, no matter how many times you take them on and off. 
Gotta love that bearded bastard. The best rifle in the game is the Heckler und Kuck G36. Despite using the same 5.56 round as the M4, it has no recoil impulse, and thus you can easily stay on target. In all reality, the M4 should have way less recoil than this, but balancing. Also, you should be able to share ammo between the G36 and the M4, but balancing. You can also get the sexiest battle rifle of all time, the Belgian beauty that is, the FNFAL, and it's quite useful as the 308 round puts the enemies down quite nicely. As with any game where you play a Spec Ops Trooper, you get the MP5, and it comes both suppressed and unsuppressed. It works well enough, but I found myself sticking with the rifles. The big problem with modern day first person shooters is the complete and total lack of player control. It's so bad these days that when you actually have some control, it's touted as a selling feature. Play your way is what it's called. Back in the day, playing a game your way was simply the way it was supposed to be. In many modern warfare games, you are given the right weapon at the right time, and usually it's the only weapon you can use. Fun, right? Here in this no-budget game, you can use whatever weapon you want at any time you want. Case in point, here in the snow level, you need to make some distant shots. At the beginning of the level, you are given a long-range bolt-action rifle. You can simply discard it if you wish and pick up something else. In fact, when I played this game the first time, I did just that. And thus, when I came to these guard towers, it was somewhat difficult to kill these foot soldiers. When I played the game a second time for the review, I remembered that and kept the rifle and shot both of them easily. You know, this stuff sounds like it should be obvious, but if you look, the vast majority of first-person shooters and games in general are played 100% identically, and you never actually have to learn anything. If there is one aspect of this game that stands out the most in 2018, it's the sheer level of freedom that you, the player, have. You can fight the various enemies pretty much any way you want to, and the levels are not just constant arenas one after the other. The levels have a great variety, and the enemies will vary up their tactics a bit, and each playthrough can actually be different. Case in point, in level 2, this guy actually runs away and tries to flank, a far cry from the run forward and shoot of many modern games. Even the music in this game is pretty good. There is of course your usual orchestral tracks, but there is thankfully some pulse pounding metal. The voice acting is surprisingly excellent, and all the voice actors actually put in an emotive performance. Absolutely nothing! I want to go to a pub, get a few pints, and tie a bun on! Now piss off! Show us a cell and then sod off, Mr. Guard. And you're bloody welcome. Speaking of performance, the game actually runs pretty good for a no budget, and I only got a few frame drops here and there, and I only had one crash to desktop during my second playthrough. Many modern games cannot boast such stability. The AI is... interesting. The friendly AI is kind of helpful, but most of the time they run out in front of your shots, and most of the time, they grab all the best cover. I would make a you're in my wee, sir reference, but that would just make me sad. And sometimes it seems that they have their brains replaced with some great value crystalline coffee powder. The most hilarious moment was right here during the ice level. This guy knows where the enemy fire is coming from, but of course turns his back on it. To what? Make sure everyone is following him? The friendly AI are thankfully queen fans, and are thus immortal and have inside them blood of kings. And so their bulk and skull-like stupidity is funny instead of aggravating. Enemy AI ain't no fear, but it is also better than the norm. Sometimes they will foolishly charge you, and sometimes they will lay down cover fire and toss grenades. One of the cool things this game does is it has you stack up and breach a door. The AI tosses in a flashbang and then slow-mo starts. 
this is great fun, and most of the time you can slaughter the enemy. But I had one instance where, just as the door was breached, the enemy threw a grenade and almost killed me. Why can't modern Space Age games do this again? In terms of gameplay, this game is very close to being top tier, and I found myself having a crap ton of fun to the point where I started getting Soldier of Fortune vibes from it, sans the gore. Well, most of the time at least. Graphics for the game have aged, and some would have looked like crap even at the time this game was released. Such as this guy apparently having Lockjaw. But they do the job and are not glaringly terrible, and some of the in-engine stuff looks good such as this chopper coming in and minigunning some snipers. Sometimes, simplicity is better than the in-your-face, multi-million dollar a minute, look at how great the art department is, bombastic crap. City Interactive may have had a small budget, but they knew how to spend it well. Now, let's look at the rather well-crafted story. The game starts up in a briefing room, where your CO lays out the backstory for the game. Zeravan and Cheval are two classic thriller villains. They started out gun running, and then when one got wounded by the British government, they turned to revenge and somehow kept making money and somehow got a bunch of well-trained troops. Look, do you want to shoot some mercs as the SAS or not? In the course of their pursuit of revenge, one of the Thrillvilles gets captured, and all seems well, but the one that was captured is being broken out, and thus it is up to you, Mint, who seems kind of dumb in some of his cutscenes, to be a bad enough bloke to stop the machinations of the evil 90s terrorists. The game's first mission takes place in the prison where one of the Thriller villains is being broken out. The level is excellent, and there are numerous fun shootouts, and it serves as a great introduction to the game. After you search the prison, it turns out that your quarry has escaped. This is where the game starts to get a bit silly, like Dr. Evil kind of silly. The next mission has you storming a server farm before the thriller villains can, I kid you not, steal all the money from the SAS. you telling me they can't, you know, put a stop payment on that? You're telling me that criminals can just suck out money from the British government and have it be honored by other banks? And it's not like they're breaking into this place and stealing pallets of cash. They are electronically wire transferring money from the British government to somewhere and somehow this is going to be honored. This is almost as bad as that bloody scene in Dark Knight Rises. It's not like the whole budget for the SAS is somehow being held in Bitcoin. Moving on, this is a game where the level design and complexity builds and gets better and better as the game goes along. You have some basic office areas to fight through as you try to reach the server room in time, and oh by the great talents, what in the hell is that? When did this game become a battle against Eldric Horrors? Yeah, you find some civilians hiding out and one woman has Cthulhu hands. I mean, are we sure we don't have to shoot her? Just look at her hands! How many souls has she stripped out and consumed? Eventually, you fight your way to the server room only to find that you arriving there at that time was part of the villain's plan all along. Just as planned. You have a classic Batman moment. Let the villain go or let some hostages at a train station get killed. Since the game still has one more area to go, you of course let him go. Then we get a really effective cutscene. You learn that the mission to save the hostages at that train station failed miserably. In a higher budgeted game, we would likely have seen that mission gone bad. But here, just hearing about it conjures up all sorts of images of how bad it could have gone. And the human mind can generally come up with things worse and higher budgeted than the game developers ever could. I would like to see more higher budgeted games use the player imagination method instead of just showing you every bloody thing. The next and last mission is in Greenland. Our two Eviltons have been stockpiling suitcase nukes. Remember that old trope? in an abandoned nuke reactor. This is the best level by far. You start out in the frozen wastes of Greenland and steadily fight your way to the underground vault where the nuke stash is. Each shootout gets more frantic and fun, and there are a couple of hilarious moments. For example, you have to activate these panels to open doors. Sometimes you get to open them, and sometimes the AI does. 
What, did the CO just get lazy or something and couldn't over them himself? That is one thing to note about this game. Like the Velociraptors of old, you the player can actually open doors. Truly the most innovative aspect of this game. I know, I know. Why is that worthy of note, you ask? But think about it. How many shooters in the current era let you open your own door? For that matter, in 2008, that was actually getting kind of rare. Eventually, you face off against one of the foul fiends and put some holes into him. But even if you shoot him in the head, he still lives long enough to monologue about how great he is and how dumb the SAS is, and then he triggers one of the nukes. But, as you would expect, you escape. However, and this is kind of sad, you're told that you cannot reach minimum safe distance in time. Here, we see the helo still intact, so you know what that means. That Mint and Co. got cooked with enough rads to power Houston for two months during the summer. So, by that logic, your player character and his entire team is going to die. Why not just have cut that line or just say, you'll barely make minimum safe distance? Damn Eastern Europeans and their depressingness. We then get one final cutscene where the last half of the Partnership of Evil is talking about his next fiendish plan only for the SAS to show up and shoot him in the back of the head. The end. Wait, what? Yep. That's how the game ends. It seems like you're going to get one more mission that will be the coolest of them all, but nope, the last villain gets his last 10 grams, and then game over. I get the feeling they ran out of money and had to cap it here. Literally. This is not a bad thing, though, as at least we get closure, at least we get the final villain get taken down, and at least we are not left with a sequel hook that will never ever be followed up on. So many full budget games run out of money before the ending, and they don't give you the kind of closure that this game does. I'm looking at you, Darkness 2! While this game was short, it didn't feel short. It felt complete. When I finished the game, I did indeed want to play some more, but I didn't feel like I was cheated out of content, and I simply felt content. As one can likely imagine, I highly recommend playing this game as it does indeed deserve to be played. Finding it can be somewhat difficult, but all good things come to those who search the internets. And so, I am Generalots, wishing you good Rainbow Six Rogue Spear and good Fear One or whatever makes you happy. If you enjoyed my review of SAS Secure Tomorrow, please consider subscribing, and if you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon so that I can continue bringing you these awesome video game reviews.